I guess it's necessary to show this at the beginning of each clip now because folks get real crazy with this copyright infringement bullshit. Anyway, hey family, it's MA Truth here. Got some stuff to show you today. Or rather read to you. I'm trying to get fancy with my phone here. You know what we doing? We doing Secret Destiny of America by Manny P. Hall. Of course, I always have to say that. And I'm picking up where I left off that just a few days ago. We were reading here about the colonization. And uh, I'm going to go right into it. I'm not going to, if you didn't pick it up before, it's the, it'll be the video before this one. All right. Like I said, I'm working with a phone and it's little. Bear with me. All righty. The character of Prospero, P R O S P E R O, magician, philosopher, and Duke of Milan, is believed to be based upon a historical person whose name was Prospero Colonna. It is interesting that Columbus usually signed himself Cologne and the Lord Baron had been referred to as the little Columbus of literature. The Tempest also introduces a honest old counselor by, uh, by name Gonzalo, who seems dedicated to a utopian mood. He refers to the Magic Isle as a commonwealth and explains that if he had a plantation there, a term used in describing colonial grants in America, he would design it along communal lines, concluding, all things in common, nature should produce, without sweat or endeavor, treason, felony, sword, pike, knife, gun, or need of any engine, would I not have, but nature should bring forth of its own kind, all foes on, all abundance, to feed my innocent people. The patrons of the Virginia Company included Lord Southampton, and those two that incomparable pair, William, Earl of Pembroke, and Philip, Earl of Montgomery, go to whom the first filio of Shakespeare was dedicated. These excellent gentlemen also permitted the use of their names as patrons of that company of actors which included William Shakespeare, a, a tight little corporation to say the least. So elaborate a plan would not have been necessary had the colonization program involved nothing more than the granting of land to royal favorites. It takes little practical difference, it makes little practical difference whether the flora or fauna of the tempest resembles the Bermudas or, as Dr. Hale suggests, corresponds more closely with the Chudderhunk Island of the coast of Massachusetts. I had to say it like that because I stumbled over it. The opponents of the Bermudian hypothesis insist that the play would have mentioned the wild hogs had these islands been the locale of the, locale of the story. If Bacon and his society were involved in the project, it would scarcely have been advisable for them to emphasize the hog symbol, which had already been used with discretion and se on several occasions. They could not afford to tie the Shakespearean production so obviously with their scheme. They were satisfied to leave their mark and seal on the emblematic coinage. The brave new world referred to by Miranda is certainly America and not some insignificant island. Prospero is the magician of the new age, the exponent of the Bacon, Bacononian method. He binds the elements to his service, and the story of his adventures in an improvisation upon the grand theme of the utopias. It was also in this brave new world that he buried his magic staff and drowned his book that is concealed in appropriate places, the formulas which were the secret of his power. Thomas Jefferson examined the repositories of the Bacon Group in colonial America check their contents, and cause them to be resealed for future ages. Several attempts have been made to locate the philosophical tombs, including excavations in England, Newfoundland, and Virginia. What is believed to be an important Baconian vault was located with the help of coated tombstones in Williamsburg, Virginia in 1938. 
after his banishment from public life, Bacon muses thus upon the philosophical advantages of political decline. Methinks they are resembled by those of Sir George Summers, who being bound by his employment to another coast, was by tempest caught upon the Bermudas, and therefore a ship racked man made full discovery of a new temperate fruitful region which none had before inhabited which mariners who had only seen its rocks had esteemed an inaccessible and enchanted place in his advice to sir george villarez or villarese bacon expressed the same sentiment which had been incorporated in the broadsides of the council for virginia according to alexander brown he must have taken these ideas from those broad sides, or he may have been one of the original authors of them, as he was a member of that council. The same author was so impressed by Bacon's references to Tempest and the inaccessible enchanted Bermudas that he asked, may not Bacon have aided Shakespeare in compiling some of his plays? Bacon always had a fancy for such things. Dr. Brown also mentions the Bacon family in America, noting that Benjamin Harrison, the 23rd president of the United States, was doubly descended from this family. It is not without reason that Lord Bacon, who had been called the moving spirit in the colonization scheme, included Christopher Columbus as one of the great inventors. Judge Brown writes of Bacon's participation in the settlement of Newfoundland. It was entirely due to the great chancellor's influence that the king granted the advances and issued the charters to Bacon and his associates and Guy's Newfoundland Company. The colonial state of calendar contains the following extract of patent. To Henry, Earl of Northampton, Sir Francis Bacon, and others for the colony or plantation in Newfoundland from 46 degrees to 52 degrees north latitude, together with the seas and islands lying within 10 leagues of the coast, the same notes, a letter in mention from John Smith to Lord Bacon, including, including description of New England, the extraordinary profits arising from the fisheries and great facilities for plantation. William Hepworth Dixon of the Inner Temple, writing in 1861, makes several important observations concerning the settlement of the New World. A few fragments will indicate the direction of his thinking. In no history of America, in no life of Bacon, have I found one word to connect him with the plantation of that great republic. Yet, like Raleigh and Delaware, he takes an active share in the labors, a conspicuous part in the sacrifices through which the foundations of Virginia and the Carolinas are first laid. Like men of far less note who have received far, higher honors in America, Bacon pays his money into the great company and takes office in its management as one of the council. To his other glories, therefore, must be added that of a founder of new states. All generous spirits rush to the defense of Virginia. Bacon joins the company with purse and voice, Montgomery, Pembroke, and Southampton. The noble friends of Shakespeare join it. A fleet commanded by Gates and Summers sails for the Thames to meet on his voyage at sea. Those singular and poetic storms and trials which add the Bermudas to our empire and the tempest to our lifetime. 175 years after Walter Raleigh laid down his life in Palace Yard for America, his illustrious blood paid for by Gondomir, G-O-N-D-O-M-A-R, in Spanish gold, the citizens of Carolina, framing for themselves a free constitution, remember the man to whom genius, to whose genius they owed their existence as a state. They call the capital of their country Raleigh. The United States can also claim among their muster roll of founders the, noble, the no less noble name of Francis Bacon. Will the day come when dropping such free, feeble names as Troy and Syracuse, the people of the great republic, will give the august and immor immortal name of Bacon to one of their splendid cities? Sir Walter Raleigh, a distinguished member of the Baconian circle, made the mistake of confiding his private plans for his South American ex expedition to the king. 
James promised to keep the secret with his honor, but hastened to whisper in the ear of Count Gondomar. The Spanish property forewarned had a strong force waiting for Raleigh at the mouth of the Orinoco, or R-I-N-O-K-O, and in, and in the fighting that followed, Raleigh's son was killed. James, who was the blank, who was to blame for the whole sorry business, promised Gondomar that Raleigh would be publicly executed, but even the popular account of the knight's death is false. Under such con conditions, it would have been madness to preserve the papers of any significant political project, that which was intentionally concealed. Look at these people. Look at that. That's supposed to be Sir Walter Raleigh. Portrait in the first edition of his great folio volume, The History of the World. Okay. All right. So getting back, it says, that which was intentionally concealed even from the records of state cannot be easily recovered after so long a time. It was an axiom of that day that a wise man was like a trunk with a double bottom. When first opened, the trunk must seem to be empty. Only those of kindred spirit could know that a man's character had a secret compartment. James Spedding, an outstanding author, authority on Bacon's life, writes, we learn incidentally from one of Bacon's, I'm not even gonna try to say that. Uh, he became Lord Keeper, which should be shortly, shortly would become Raleigh, which was shortly, which shortly before Raleigh sailed, he had long conversation with him in Gray's Inn walks. I'm sorry, I just screwed all that up, but I'm not about trying to read it again. Purpose of reading this is for us to understand their perspective on, on what, what happened. These are the lies that they tell each other. And in these lies are elements of truth. We got to keep be mindful of that. Uh, but it must have been interesting and was probably and probably important for it was then that the that he kept the Earl of Exeter so long waiting upstairs. Obviously, they were exchanging some information. Like I said, I screwed that all up and I apologize for it. Moving right along, Benjamin Desarelli gave some attention to the extraordinary volume, The History of the World, uh, which Sir Walter Raleigh is supposed to have written. So that's what this is about. During his confinement in the Tower of London, Desarelli, whose scholarship equipped him to weigh the difficulties of so vast a project, concluded that Raleigh, whose natural inclinations and opportunities belied the work, must have received considerable assistance from other wits. He listed several candidates for the honors of co-authorship, but if Desarelli stated the dilemma skillfully, his solutions are inconclusive. The only names of interest which he advanced were the Earl of Northumberland and Ben Johnson. Okay. See, see it's the life of the times of Francis Bacon and see the curiosities of literature. I'm not into all of that. I just want to know what these Mort boys was, was plotting and scheming. The thing is, is that these immigrants came over here and stole our land. That's all. That's bottom line. That's, how about that for a conclusion? Bacon was visited during his imprisonment and the friendship between the two was visited by Raleigh during his imprisonment and the friendship between the two men was sufficiently founded upon previous efforts which Bacon had made to cement a genuine alliance between Raleigh and the unfortunate Earl of Essex. Ben Johnson act acted as an intermediary and, ex and agent extraordinary on several occasions. It will be remembered that Johnson was at Stratford on the festive evening which is said to have contributed to the Bard's demise. If Shakespeare had small Latin and less Greek, it is unlikely that Raleigh had more Hebrew. The first edition of the History of the World is embellished with numerous emblems and devices belonging to the Baconian group. That's what I would be interested in seeing myself, are these emblems and what they mean. The title page has been a subject of controversy for centuries. Ben Johnson, referring to Sir Walter Raleigh, told Drummond, the best wits in England were employed in making his history. Bacon became a member of the Virginia Company in 1609, 
the characters of that year and of 1612 dra drafted by Sandys were prepared for the king's signature by Henry Hobart and Sir Francis Bacon. The Bacon's interest in the colonies testimony is borne by William Starchery in the dedication dated 1618 of a manuscript copy of his histories of travail into Virginia, Britannia. Your Lordship ever approving yourself a most noble favor of the Virginia plantation, being from the beginning with other lords and earls of the principal council applied to propagate and guide it. One of the reasons why there is such difficulty in tracing Bacon's activities in connection with the plantation is that the records of the Privy Council to the year 1613 were destroyed by the fire at White Hall in 1618. Incidentally, the boundaries of the Virginia colony extended to the west coast of California. Oh, we got to dig into that. Charles Mills Gailey devised the group instrumental in the foundation of the Virginia Company of London into two sections, the liberals or patriots and the imperialists who supported the king in reserving to the crown the right to form the government of the colonies and plantations. Let me say that again. One of the reasons why there is so, so much difficulty in tracing Bacon's activities in connection with the plantation is that the records of the Privy Council to the year 1613 were destroyed by fire at White Hall in 1618. Incidentally, the boundaries of the original Virginia colony extended to the west coast of California. Anybody got any drop on that? Please, please put it out there. Charles Mills Gailey devised the group instrumental in the foundation of the Virginia Company of London into two sections. Uh, I read that the liberals or patriots and the imperialists who supported the king and they wanted to reserve it says in reserving to the crown the right to form the government of the colonies and plantations that's why i think i know we are prisoners of war these united states are colonial colonies still to this day that hasn't changed okay it hasn't changed This conflict was the real source of the revolution in 1775, which resulted in the complete independence of the American colonies. That is a lie. We're not independent. Among the liberals, Gailey includes Christopher Brooke and John Selden. They were both in their hours of ease, poets after a fashion, members of the pastoral courtier of the Inns of Court. Brooks' bosom friend was the poet Don or Donnie. He was also intimate with Shakespeare's follow dra fellow uh, dramatist Johnson and Drayton and his epic dramatic admirer Davies of Hereford. Hereford. Okay, so I'm going to finish this page and I'm, I'm done. Gailey shows the unusual systematic indifference to Bacon's part in the colonization plan, and the few references which he makes to his lordship are consistently derogatory. He does, however, mention that Bacon, in his essay of Plantation, which was not published until after the great chancellor's death, appeared to agree with the practical phase of the liberals' policy. Gailey says, Bacon may have collaborated with Sandys, but his interest in the colonies was romantic and always for the glorification of the crown. Remember that, always for the glorification of the crown. Everything is done for the crown, ain't that right? Why? Because we are a colony. Why is that? Because that's what they did. They stole everything. Hope you can see it. This is from a clip called Aztec Civilization Creation. 
I'm gonna put the link to it. Today we 